Right. Here we go, guys. Welcome to another episode of Fire Builders Live. My name is Josh Corporal. We are streaming live from Key West, Florida. And today I have very special guest, Hillary Billings, on the show. Welcome, Hillary. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy that you're here as well. Thanks for taking the time. This is going to be such an awesome conversation with you today. Uh, before we get into it, let me explain for those that are listening for the first time how Fire Builders Live works, what we do is we bring on these experts like Hillary here. We take these big goals, these big ideas, and we break them down into small steps, things that you can do every day to improve. And today is a big one. Today's a big one because everybody I know that's listening right now has had this happen. It's a confidence thing. How do you gain more confidence? Not just to gain more confidence because you wanna feel stronger, but also to be able to pursue the things in life that you really truly want. And Hillary is the person to be talking to about this. Let me give you a little bit of Hillary's background to show you what I mean. She's a burn victim turned Miss Nevada. She is the creator of The Hillary Show, which I just found out right before, as Hillary and I were talking about this uh, right before the show, it has surpassed 30 million views this month, which is incredible. So congratulations on that. And you know, it has the reason that it is so popular is because there's a lot of lighthearted content that breaks up your newsfeed and it exemplifies the, a confident lifestyle. Uh, she's also the host of the upcoming podcast, The Red, Car Red Carpet Confident. You've just lived an extraordinary life because you've been willing to fail, you've been willing to be challenged, but you've overcome those failures. You've built yourself up confident brick by confident brick. You've done things like producer at E! News. You were a travel host with Norwegian Cruise Line. You've trained lions, which I would love to talk about. I think that's incredible. You, I saw that you danced with Mark Cuban, which is very cool. You know, all that kind of stuff just, just leads you to, to have become now this curator of confidence, this inadequacy, inadequacy assassin. And, and honestly, those feelings those moments that you have in your life of being confident, of feeling confident, right? They come from having these types of conversations, being authentic and taking action. And that is what we are gonna talk about today. It is so good to have you here, Hillary. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Josh. I'm so excited to be here. Welcome from Las Vegas. <laughs> Las Vegas, that was my first question. You know, where are you in the world? Yeah, sunny Las Vegas, Nevada, not a cloud in the sky. I think today's high is 109 degrees, so. <laughs> 109 degrees, the dry heat, but is it like, I mean, it's only going to get worse. What's the hottest that it's been there that, since you've been there? Uh, I think 115 was the hottest that we've had so far. I will say, though, you know, I spent the past four and a half years in the south. Uh, this is nothing compared to the humidity for me. I cannot do the humidity. So a hats off to you doing that in Key West right now. <laughs> it's between the humidity and the roosters that I'm sure you're going to hear <laughs> this entire conversation. Like, it's enough to drive it's you crazy. perfect soundtrack. It's the perfect <laughs> yeah. soundtrack. <laughs> Yeah, it's well, tell me what it like. So now that we're in the middle of this pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're still in lockdown mode. I have no idea how Las Vegas is handling it. Tell me what a light, like a typical day in Hillary's life is these days. My my day. Oh gosh. Uh Right now, I'm focused a lot on content creation. So a typical day, my boyfriend and I started getting up at 5.30, uh, which is not what you would think you would do during a pandemic, but it's proven to be so fruitful. We spend the first two hours reading, journaling, uh, you know, having a really slow morning, blogging, working on newsletters and other content, formulating the plan for the day, uh, you know, working with some brand strategy clients, or then just hopping straight into filming some videos, editing videos, uh, you know, whether that's pranking a friend or, you know, doing a science experiment, there's always something fun to be doing. So my days, I mean, frankly, I'm, I'm really blessed to have the days that I have. And I'll probably wrap them up with a phone conversation with a coaching client or a friend or somebody that needs additional support and thinking about other ways that I can be bringing impact. So that's what a typical day looks like for me. Oh, and then we take our dog Lambert for like three walks a day. So three it's a great Pyrenees. <laughs> what kind of dog is Lambert? He's a great Pyrenees. So he looks like a polar bear. Uh, and people think that you just walk a polar bear around and he's, he's fabulous. He's our rescue. So we love him. 
Man, does that kill it? Do you ever think about shaving him with it being 109? No, they actually, so fun fact about Great Pyrenees, which I'm sure all of you came to this TED Talk to learn about, uh, they have double coats. So their undercoat is actually really light, fine fur. Uh, it looks like snow when he sheds it, but it actually insulates him a lot like huskies from both extreme heat and extreme cold. So we just ensure he doesn't go out during the middle of the day, that he loves being outside. Uh, and he has a great time chasing bunnies. He's becoming an expert bunny chaser. We live right up against the mountains and uh, he loves to get back in there and hunt some jackrabbits. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Cool, Lambert. Man, I'll tell you what, uh, that's awesome. And and I also agree that it, it feels so good to be able to design your day, mm. you know, to be able to figure out what it is that's important to you and structure your day accordingly. And I feel that your ability to do that is a direct reflection of the kinds of choices that you've made in your life. Those choices stem from, you know, they, they really do stem from a level of confidence. Uh, but I would imagine that it wasn't always like that for you. No one just grows up and says, I'm the most confident person in the world. Come on, world. Like, I'll take you on. How, what was the journey like for you? So actually, you know, there was research to support that there's actually certain confidence genes that exist. So there are people that are more predisposed to be resilient uh, and to have that sort of confidence and laissez-faire attitude as they're growing up. Um, but that also then is determined a lot by their circumstances, how that continues to foster itself forward. Uh, and you also have people that are put into a lot of adverse situations that requires that they build that resiliency. Uh, and I would say I was definitely more of a skill builder over the course of my life than naturally having that inclination. I would say I'm more on the anxious side, what's gonna go wrong? My brain's always looking for, that lizard brain is constantly running. So for me, every moment in my life where I've come across adversity has prepared me for the future in order to build this confidence. Confidence by definition is the ability to rely upon something or someone the, just the belief that you can rely upon something or someone. So that could be yourself, that could be others, that could be a God that you believe in, uh, or just the circumstances that everything's gonna be okay. That's what confidence really is. So it's building this self-reliance, it's building this certainty that regardless of what uncertain circumstances come your way, you can handle them. Now, luckily for me, I, at a very young age, uh, started dealing with very uncertain circumstances. You know, I grew up in a, in a low SES home uh, and it was very feast or famine my entire childhood and growing up. Uh, by the time I got into college, you know, I was struggling with depression. I had friends uh, commit suicide in high school and college and that uncertainty and that loss of, of dealing with that kind of loss and that kind of magnitude for that age range. And then, you know, graduating the top of my class, still being very high functioning, uh, anxious and depressed person, I then went on to be rejected from every single graduate school that I applied to, even though I was the number one graduate out of UNLV and was given this award called Outstanding Graduate. Uh, so at that point, I thought that my life was over. Everything that I had worked towards was no longer guaranteed. Uh, so I did what any no normal person would do, and I took off to Nicaragua and started a travel blog. And it of was- Of course, yes. like as one does, Well, you're in Key obviously. West, you get it. Yeah, I totally get it. And it was through that experience of, of starting to travel and putting myself in these very uncomfortable, unfamiliar situations and having to learn to rely on myself, uh, learn to like myself. I think that's something, too, that a lot of people struggle with because they haven't taken the time to get to really know them. You know, we spend so much of our, our teens and our childhood just trying to avoid ridicule, trying to avoid criticism. And oftentimes those things that are very unique and special about us are the things that get us picked on. Um, I've always been a fast talker. I've always worn glasses. Uh, I've always loved, like, uh, how would you say, parroting back information. So it's like I would stand in front of the mirror and pull up a shampoo bottle and like make my own shampoo commercials. And then come to find out that would be a skill set that would serve me as an on camera host years later. But at the time, just seemed very weird, right? And we all have those things, whether it's you like to paint or you dress a certain way or you're into a certain style of music. Uh, if it doesn't fit in with what is considered normal and acceptable through that small peripheral vision, then we start to box ourselves in. We start to change those behaviors because we're afraid of being embarrassed. We're afraid of that criticism. We're afraid of that ridicule from our peers. We want that acceptance which is why I think by the time we get to our 20s, none of us know who we are, and we all have to go on these walkabouts to figure out who we really are internally. And so my travels by me you know, taking 
getting rejected from graduate school, having to deal with that thought of failure, uh, and then traveling the world, meeting all sorts of different people and, and all sorts of different walks of life really taught me how to rely on myself and also see that the world is not as scary as a place as I thought it was. Um, and it, that was really what made me beholden to this idea of, of getting outside your comfortable, getting comfortable with the uncomfortable uh, and learning to love the unknown. And the reality is, is the whole rest of our life is unknown. And so to try to make it certain, to try to control it now uh, is a futile mission. And especially right now, there's, there's no more time that this is, so perfect for us to be talking about them right now in the middle of a pandemic. I had a friend post uh, on social media the other day to say like, what would, have you guys thought about what would happen if we were still in the same situation a year from now? And the litany of comments that were going down of like, yes, I have, and I can't deal with it. And I'm, you know, I'm binging shows and I'm binging on food and I'm drinking a lot because that idea just terrifies me. And it, it, it's both humorous and sad to me because the reality is, is for us to be focusing on something so far away when there's 365 days in between that could bring us car accidents, the lottery, you know, deaths in our family, new jobs, losing jobs, new babies, whatever that might be, uh, that will forever change what our future looks like. So to try to control it now or to think that our circumstances would be the same now only brings us down and hinders our ability to have confidence in ourselves right now, which will then impact how we affect our future. And we're going to talk about today uh, something that I call the assumption analysis and how we can start to break down some of these fears and these exaggerated emotions that we attach to future circumstances to help us build our confidence today. But yes, all this to say that, you know, through these experiences, the rejection, uh, the death, the loss, the the feeling inadequate because I didn't have the money that my friends did, uh, you know, didn't come from the families that my friends did, were all things that helped to to forge and hone me into a more resilient and adaptable person uh you know and then going on character i mean yeah. it just it honestly it just builds it builds so much character in a person i'm curious as to why you went to nicaragua so great question i was interviewing at graduate schools it was february of 2011 and it was five feet of snow it was miserable i had been on back and forth on planes for god knows how many days doing these back and forth interviews just trying to find any any of these 15 schools 14 schools that would accept me and I just happened to follow this travel uh, surfer, sur pro surfer, her name was Holly Beck, and she ran a surf retreat out of Nicaragua. And I was looking at the blog and just thinking, oh my gosh, this looks amazing. This looks like so much fun. And what a great way to celebrate my last hurrah before I go off to grad school. <laughs> so I had just enough money in my bank account to put the deposit down to go to her surf camp, uh, never thinking that this was not gonna become my future. And so instead it became a trip for me to hide out and that trip specifically was was so formative. Uh, it was the first time in my adult life where I wasn't in direct competition or felt like I was in direct competition with everyone around me. Um, it was all women. I was the youngest girl there. I think I was 21 at the time, 22 at the time. And uh, you know, you had CEO executives of major companies. You had photographers. You had artists. You had other pro surfers. Uh, incredible women doing incredible things that all had different reasons for being there. And uh, that was the first trip where I, I realized that I didn't have to be everything to everyone. I just had to have the right people around me. And it was suddenly clicked like, aha, it's kind of like Captain Planet, you know, earth wire, you know, fire, it all comes together and we can save the world. Uh, that reference might be lost on some people, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, but I know what you're talking about. And then you had the little heart yeah, guy. Yeah, like, oh. heart. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And that you you don't need to be everything to everyone. And, and by trying to do that, you'll be nothing to nobody. So instead, learning to focus on my strengths and learning to focus on what I wanted. And, and again, having the question asked, of like, what do I really want to do now? What's the plan moving forward? Uh, now that I was no longer able to be accepted the way that I wanted to be accepted on you know, both a metaphorical and literal level. Um, and so starting to have that exploration and, and share my journey and through my writing, you know, that launched a career in journalism and on camera hosting and, you know, through all these travel experiences, I got to go live with the Firewalkers in Fiji. I got to, you know, serve as a consultant for the Lion Habitat Ranch and, and help them develop their trainer for a day program with their lions. Um, and that's also, you know, it kind of led me to how I was burned uh, and being hit with a malfunctioning firework on the 4th of July. And all of this- yeah, just That story, by the way, like that story is incredible. <laughs> I mean, maybe just, 
just yeah. really quick touch on on that because I don't yeah I don't want to focus on that so much but I do think it's important that people know like what happened and the circumstances that you had to bounce back from yeah I had just gotten back from living with the firewalkers in Fiji I spent a month with them and the irony is not lost on me that I had just gotten back from living with a tribe that was notorious for being uh, the originators of the practice of walking on hot coals. Um, and they also, you know, there's so much mystery and uh, mysticism around their ability to not get burned by the coals when they walk on them. And sociologists have been studying them and other tribes like them for years as to why this works when in other situations. And, you know, I know Tony Robbins, he learned how to firewalk from them and takes a lot of their teachings into his uh, events worldwide. And uh, so it was so fascinating to have been with a tribe that was focused around fire and the healing properties and, and the belief system around that. And to turn around, it was the 4th of July. Um, I just gotten back. I was having a really hard time assimilating back to life uh, stateside. And everything that day was just kind of telling me not to go. I couldn't find my keys. I broke a glass. I stepped on the glass. I couldn't find the clothes I wanted to wear. Uh, and so I, I finally show up at my friend's party and they had purchased some illegal fireworks from an Indian reservation outside of Vegas, which was kind of a standard practice. They always had the best ones. As one does, yes. of course. Uh, right? And I, it was weird because I, I've never had an aversion to fireworks before, but that night I was like, I'll just, I'll sit over here. I don't want to, I won't help you unpack them. You go ahead. I just didn't want anything to go wrong. Uh, and then ironically, you know, the first firework of the night gets lit up the fuse disintegrates and then nothing happens and everyone gets quiet because we know that means that something's wrong uh, if the firework doesn't do the thing. So then the firework exploded, but it exploded not in a pretty way. Uh, and the fuse, which was on fire, traveled 30 feet through the air. It curved around and then came right at my face. And I turned to the side and it hit my sunglasses and went down my shirt. And uh, I ended up suffering second and third degree burns to my body. And thank God I didn't find the clothes that I wanted to wear. This is gonna sound kind of weird probably to you as a guy, but like I ended up wearing the super push up padded Victoria's Secret bra that I was not happy to be wearing because uh, I couldn't find my other one. And uh, it ended up saving my my chest because like it ate through the whole thing. And if if that hadn't have been there, it's like, I don't even know what I would look like today. It would have so, been the skin instead of like the whole uh, padding. And yeah. And it's still, I mean, I, I still receive second and third degree burns regardless, but it's like, that was just an additional layer that I'm just so grateful that I had. Uh, and the chest, another fun story for this TED talk, um, is well, the slowest by, part of the body. <laughs> by, by the way, I just, before you go any further than that, uh, have you, did you ever reach out to Victoria's Secret and say thank you? <laughs> I haven't, but you know what? I, I should, I have a friend that's a, a model for them. Maybe I should just let her know to give them yeah, a, a just thumb save for me. me. <laughs> Yeah. Put on your armor every day, ladies. <laughs> yeah, just Maybe from a random firework accident. <laughs> so sorry. Yeah. So go on. Yeah. Go on. So uh, the chest is the slowest healing part of the body. I had all these surf bars and and trips planned for the fall that I had to cancel, uh, and I I didn't tell anyone really that this was happening. Frankly, I was kind of embarrassed by the situation. I know it sounds weird. Um, and so I kept blogging about previous travels that I'd had uh, to keep that going, but I was just hiding out with just around my close circle of friends and family in Vegas for six months while I was waiting to heal. And, you know, it was, I felt like Frankenstein. I felt like I'd never feel feminine or beautiful again. And six months in, I was hired for a gig and it was this really slinky, pretty black dress. And I turned around to look at myself in the mirror and I saw the scars and I just broke down. And I knew at that point that I couldn't keep going on like this, that this was not, I was tired of the pity party and I had to figure out a way to get past this. The only thing that I could think of was what sounded the most uncomfortable and nothing sounded more terrifying than being on stage in a bikini and having someone judge me based upon my appearance. So I entered the Miss Nevada United States pageant uh, expecting to get a blog out of it and just go through the motions of doing this so I could say that I did it. And now that I've been judged in a bikini, I have no reason to feel pity for myself in my day-to-day -day life moving forward. And then I won. Uh, so that was a very unexpected turn of events, but it was a beautiful, and amazing beautiful too. And, and I'm, I'm curious as to like that decision, what you said there just now, where you were like, so you know, I'm feeling horrible about myself. I feel just like, you know, shit. And, and I decided to do the most uncomfortable thing I can think of and go and join this and enter myself into this beauty pageant. What, it, what is it that you think 
causes you to do that where other people do not. Those well, types of, you know, those types of challenges, self challenges. I'm really grateful that at that point in time, I'd had experience doing that with all the travel. Like just, you know, people romanticize going overseas and, you know, I love the idea of being in Paris and I, my first, one of my first trips outside of Nicaragua was going to Austria. It's like, I don't speak German. I know nothing about the language or the culture. I'm, you know, how to navigate around. This was kind of right before the time of, we were just starting to get into international text. The iPhone was just invented. Um, so it was not as easy as it would even be now. And having to learn that self-reliance of, okay, self, like how are we gonna get breakfast today? And I know Tim Ferriss does this in a lot of ways too, where he won't pack his uh, toiletries when he travels because he thinks that's inefficient and it becomes an adventure just to have to go get normal supplies uh, or how to figure out how to order breakfast or where you're gonna go for the day. And so I've had a lot of experience at this point in time of doing that uh, and getting the opportunity to continually reinforce that whatever circumstance I run across, I can help navigate out of it. And I just need to know what the best method to do that. And usually wherever there's resistance is where you wanna go. <laughs> because that's something that you're trying to avoid. And we spend so much time in our lives avoiding pain that we don't get to actually enjoy as much pleasure as we could. So I'm a big fan of ripping off the Band-Aid uh, and, and finding ways to move yourself forward, even just little actionable steps, uh, and even finding ways just to bring more vibrance into your life. So whether that's through taking a cooking class or trying a new recipe if you like to cook or watching a new show that you would never watch or reading a book from a perspective that you would never gain just widening that lens because when we feel inadequate when we feel uh that self-pity when we're stuck in that state of narcissism uh, ego narcissism might be even a strong word for that when we're so self-focused on what we can't do it's because our, we have such a limited perspective on what the rule is for life. And the more that we explore other perspectives, we start to see that the rules that we've created don't always apply. They apply to us because we make them apply to us, but not to everything and not to everybody. So as we start to gain more of those life experiences and, and continually intentionally push to have a wider lens, that's when like black and white goes away and life becomes gray, but it also becomes very vibrant and colorful at the same time. Exactly. And that's where the magic lies, yes. you know, that that's where you really start to, you start to, to get to know yourself. You start to get mm -hmm. to know the world around you. The, these doors open up mentally, physically, like, mm -hmm. and, and I can tell you that the idea, you know, there's one thing where everybody says, oh, I'm just going to get comfortable being uncomfortable, but it's another to, to expect that that uncomfort or that discomfort that you would experience is um, you know, it's a natural byproduct of your action. So for instance, if you're starting a business mm -hmm. and you, you just expect that you're going to be uncomfortable because there's a lot of stuff that you've never done and it's going to be very, very tough, but to actively pursue discomfort is a whole other level in my mind, like to really reach out and say, what's the worst, what's the worst thing that I can do? Because if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to jump into anywhere in the pool, it's going to be the deep end. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I love that. And, I, and that actually is a great, what you said about even just taking small steps is a great segue into the first question that I love to ask guests on this show, yeah. which the people that are listening, if they'd like, you know, if they'd like to learn how to build a little bit more confidence in their life and they don't necessarily have the opportunity to go to Nicaragua or to, um, you know, or that they have something traumatic that happens to them that mm -hmm. actually, you know, kind of primes the pump to yeah. start making changes. What would you suggest in your experience? How should they start? So I think we first need to talk, and this is a great question. I'm so excited and I love talking about this. I think we first need to address what kind of the most popular opinion when it comes to building confidence is, which I know we were talking about this earlier, is this whole fake it till you make it concept. That's it's right, you hear it all the time. All the time, it gets thrown around all the time. And I have such a bone to pick with this phrase for a litany of reasons. But first of all, when you think about being feelings of inadequacy, when you think about being uncomfortable, when you think about being anxious or scared or insecure or lacking self-assurance, all of these things, right, that keep us from building confidence, there's a gap between those feelings. That's an extreme emotion on one side. And then confidence, let's say, lays on the other, which again, we're defining as the ability, the belief that you can rely upon something or someone, right? That's where we want to go. So for you to jump from this negative feeling, okay, have you ever been in a fight 
Josh, and someone has just told you to calm down, like you're really angry, and they're like, you just need to calm down. What does that Every do to day. you? What does that do Every to you? Day. It, it, no, it doesn't calm you down, right? <laughs> no, it does not. It makes it worse a it lot of the time. It makes it worse. So. It makes it worse. So if someone tells you, if you're feeling one extreme and they tell you just to just jump to the other extreme, like it's no big deal, a couple things happen. One, you feel like this person doesn't understand you or your situation. They don't understand your feelings. And or now you feel even inadequate about having these feelings of inadequacy because maybe there's something wrong with you because you're not able to make that jump. But when you think about it, that's a big scale to try to slide up from feeling inadequate to confident. So what we want to do is pull you out of that exaggerated emotion because exaggerated emotions create exaggerated realities. I'm going to say that again. Exaggerated emotions create exaggerated realities. What do I mean by that? Well, when you're having a bad day, everything's bad. You know, so and so is late to the meeting. Someone made your latte wrong. You know, the comment that someone left that said, have a nice day on social media, you suddenly read as with an attitude of have a nice day. Everything becomes more negative. It intensifies, it magnifies because of that state that you're in. We have to remove you from that negative state. And when you ask somebody to jump to fake it till you make it, you're asking them to pretend that there's something that they're not. Uh, or something that they can't be right then in that moment. And let's say in the best case scenario, they do make that jump. They're not gonna be able to sustain it. And then there's gonna be a question of while they're in that state, if people like them or are enjoying the interaction with them, do they really like them for who they authentically are or do they just like this act that they're putting on, right? So then you have this cognitive dissonance around the relationships that you're building, the success that you're having. And then, you know, worst case scenario, or I guess the next best worst case scenario is that you don't make the jump and then you feel worse. And then you feel like, well, maybe I'm not meant to feel that way. Maybe I can't feel that way. And then you slide further down the scale. And there's so much research to support that when people are told this fake it till they make it concept and they're living in that negative extreme, they can't make it there. And then they go even further down the scale and they feel worse. So we need to stop with this whole fake it till you make it. Instead, we need to build a stepping stone. We need to get to a neutral place, right? You can't ask somebody to go from a negative emotion to a positive emotion without there having to be some sort of moment of neutrality of, okay, I'm no longer attached to this as being about how I'm feeling. We need to get to a middle place. So this is the first step. It is the first step. It's a hard step, but it's the step that we need to focus on. We can't just jump to confidence from feeling inadequate, we have to come to neutral. So how do we do that, right? Well, I have this tool called the assumption analysis tool that I like to utilize in this situation and, and, and bring up as an example. So let's say for example, Josh, a friend of yours uh, got an award for his podcast, right? Really awesome award, big notoriety. You're really happy for him, but at the same time, that leads to additional questions in your head of like, oh man, like I didn't get that award. And what does that say about me or my podcast or my future? You have three options. So the fact is, the award happened, this other person got this award. Now you have three ways that you can interpret it. If you're feeling crummy, you're not gonna jump to the positive, which is, well, if they did it, I can too you're probably living in the negative, which is, oh, they did it, so I can't. But the reality is there's a third option that most people don't consider, which is this has nothing to do with me. Nothing is, has no bearing on my life, my success, my future. Them getting this has nothing to do with me. And based upon which choice you make, the positive, the negative, or the neutral, then determines your future and how you perceive the opportunities of your future. So if you take the positive perspective of, well, they did it, I can too, it leads to possibility, it leads to opportunity, but it leads to opportunity and possibility within the realm of that rule and that path that you see. So you could potentially go to that person and ask them how they did what they did and follow those steps, but it creates a very linear path as to how to get to where you want to go. If and, you take... li and limiting, it seems like. Exactly. You know, for instance, limiting. the thing that you're trying to achieve mm -hmm. is exactly the thing that you're comparing yourself to and it can't be any greater, right, or worse. It's yes. that thing and that yes. in itself that destination is, is really, really limiting, I agree. Yeah, so you see where this is going. So then if, if you're in the negative space and you take the negative perspective of, well, they did it so I can't, well, now you've, you've also limited your opportunities and you've limited the rules as to how you can be successful moving forward. But with the neutral perspective, of their success, this moment has no bearing on my worth, on my success, on my future, that creates freedom. So there's a piece with that 
that nothing that's happening externally around you has to actually say anything about you. We choose to make it that way, but it doesn't have to. Uh, and utilizing this tool and just going through, okay, what's the fact? What actually happened? Because even then we tend to exaggerate the fact, well, so-and-so got this award, which means that everybody hates me. Like that's not the fact. The fact is they got the award, right? Just by choosing to factually state the event, we take the emotion out of this. And this is where, you know, right now we could use this in the media, right? Of let's just state what happened and not put a spin on it and let people draw their own conclusions. Uh, and, and you see this every day in the social media exchange too. Like people will take a piece of information and then they'll exaggerate it and attach, well, this means this now, this is why, so this thing happened. And so now the government's controlling this, or this means this side's trying to do that or whatever, versus here's the actual situation. And just by removing the emotion just by coming back to a neutral position and how we're looking at the inciting event we're going to feel more confident and we're going to be able to have more confidence when we have dialogue with people or ourselves around what comes next so the very first thing we need to be doing is finding as many ways as possible to come back to neutral because from neutral we can then move forward you can't shift gear in a car without coming back to neutral you'll you'll kill your engine right so we want to make sure that we're always coming back to neutral first. Yeah, that makes sense. And and so I'm curious actually, in your example here, mm -hmm. if I were to ask you, if it's all about coming back to neutral, right? And removing the, any emotion from the outcome of, yeah. of what's gonna happen, is it a situation then where I should focus positive energy on enjoying the process of, of getting to a successful place? Like for instance, in your podcast example, like I see my friend, uh, they they win all these awards for their podcast, and I say to myself, they don't deserve those awards. Their mm -hmm. podcast is shit, you know, like kind of thing <laughs> or whatever, right? It's, it's so horrible. Yeah. Uh, but but whatever, they won the award. I do you try and get people to a place where they are asking themselves, okay, well, you say superficially that you want to win the award too, but that's not the way to go because that, like you said, is a very limiting view. Mm -hmm. In in place of that. What is it that you really want? Like, what's the award going to bring you? Is it going to bring you the feeling of satisfaction and fulfillment? Is it going to bring you more money? Um, like, is it a situation that bringing yourself back to neutral allows you to truthfully answer those questions as to why, as opposed to focusing specifically on your shiny goal of an award? Absolutely. We, the neutrality place is so great because it helps you objectively look at what you actually want. And, and from that, you can then create a plan to get there. And even just by knowing what it is that you really want will help you to uncover you know, all the possibilities in the universe to conspire in your favor. So yes, when we're in neutral, we're more able to object. Like you see this all the time. My poor boyfriend will see this all the time when I, like, we get into a conflict or an argument and you know, let's say it's over the dishes. Uh, and I'll be like, I just want you to do the dishes or why didn't you do this today? This is a terrible example because he always does the dishes. But in all this to say, I'll get upset and then I'll come back once I have cooled down, right? And I can neutrally say, actually, I, I really just felt like, you know, we weren't being a team right now. And like, that's why I was upset. It wasn't because of this situation of these dishes, which is me more than likely not doing the dishes than him. But all the, but again, like when we're looking at it, we want, to know what the underlying root cause is. So somebody else winning an award hits on maybe let's say something within you that you're not good enough. And so understanding, well, what's really being triggered here? Why did I create this meaning? Why is this a negative experience for me? Then that helps you to move forward so you can uncover and heal those parts of you and find ways to affirm that worth in other ways, especially when it comes to externally validating markers, right? Like you hit a million followers, you hit a hundred million views, you make you know X amount of money, you whatever that might be for you, you get this award, you get an Emmy, you get the Grammy. There's often a reason why we feel that we need that to justify our art or something that somebody told us that we couldn't make a successful career out of being artists or creators or that we never amount to anything that we've been reinforcing our whole lives. Um, you also see this come up with people that criticize other people. I know as a, as a content creator, it's like I make uh, all sorts of different content, but on the Hillary show, for example, it's very light. We're doing science experiments. We're doing pranks. You know, every now and again, I'll do a comedic monologue. We'll do some sketch comedy. It's super light content. It's not always the highest art and it's not always the best produced stuff, 
But you know, part of the practice for me is just practicing in public. I for so long was such a perfectionist about needing to have everything be perfect that it took me forever to create anything. And even then I would get so bogged down in the comments that it would then stall my progress to keep moving forward. This has been a practice in putting it up and move on to the next and putting it up and move on to the next. And the audience that it's resonating with that works really well for, but there are plenty of people that are looking at this and from my perspective, seeing something that they could easily do, but they're not doing it. So they have to be negative about it. They have to criticize it because if they actually said that this was something worth doing, then they would have to look at themselves as to why they're not going after what they want to be doing. Right. Sure. So, sure. so there's Can a I tell you a secret? Please. I like secrets. Right. Can I tell you a secret? That whole thing about uh, being a perfectionist and just, and, and then just forcing yourself to get your stuff out there. That's what I'm doing on this show. Love it. I had no idea what I was doing when I first started. <laughs> and and I still don't, but I knew. None of us I do. Yeah, That's none of us do. And, <laughs> and like, but you know that if you know yourself enough, you say, look, if you record this and then, you, then you're going to want to edit it, then you're going to want to make it perfect and take mm -hmm. out all of this stuff. And that's just going to do nothing but stall you out. Um, so just, just put it out there and stop trying to be perfect about it. But I feel like that type of approach, like you're saying, resonates with people because those imperfections people can relate to. Um, yeah, and, and there's going to be just, those that just point them out. Even, but even the yours, even yours on the show, like right now. Here, let me put this up because I, I don't like Perian said, Hillary, Aww. your enthusiasm is so infectious, Mwah. right? Thank and, you. And and it's true, right? You this live show, no one knows what's going to happen. Um, as we're talking and having this conversation and people are listening and watching, but, but that's the thing. It's so off the cuff and how you're describing a lot of this stuff. People just understand it better than if this was a, you know, a very well shot PowerPoint presentation where you've articulated everything exactly right. Yeah. And yeah, it's sterile at that point. Mm -hmm. People like people like things that are real. They like, you know, and I think that's part of the thing that I'm fighting against on social media are these manicured problems, these filtered problems. You know, a lot of my Instagram content and on my entertainer page, I, I talk about different inadequacy situations and stories and, and things that I've been through and the hopes that it'll help people take some of the pressure off themselves. Like we need to stop continuing to, to perpetrate this idea that we have to do things perfectly or in a way that appeases other people in order for it to go up into the world. Now, I do think that we need to be aware and conscious of other people's emotions. We need to have an awareness. We need to ask questions as to if we're intentionally trying to hurt or spin something in a way that is not serving people. Uh, I think that's incredibly important to be asking. But at the end of the day, like your art is your art. And you know what you need to do to grow and push yourself forward is all you know what that is. Uh, and there's gonna be people that, that don't like it. But the reality is, it's like hindsight's always twenty twenty. I don't think there's a director or a writer or author out there who wouldn't go back and edit something in the content if they had a chance. But just think about if, you know, Harry Potter had never come out. Uh, if she had decided that it wasn't worthwhile or, you know, she needed to get something perfect and she never did, like what would it have done to our society, right? Yeah, Do exactly. Not, don't deny it's people your art and your wisdom because it's not you know perfect in how you're putting it out there. Exactly, I 100% agree. And I'm actually glad that you brought that up because that leads me to my next question. If it really is about getting to a neutral place so that you can understand the underlying, the undercurrents of why you're doing something, right? Taking yep. the emotion out of it, and yep. finding the why, right? If someone were just to do that consistently, not once, not twice, but try and do it every day, every time that they feel a lack of confidence, mm -hmm. right? Where in your experience would that get people? How would they feel? I mean, from my experience, it's, it's a life-changing perspective shift because it allows you to disassociate from every negative conversation, every negative, you know, social media spat, anything that's coming into your world that's not serving you moving forward. I mean, just think about it. To shift for someone, let's say, that's going through a divorce, to shift from "I'm a failure," "This didn't work," "Everyone hates me," "I can't believe I did that," to "We we ended it because it wasn't a good fit." 
Like there's a dramatic leap in those two perspectives. And just by shifting that, it allows that person to put that focus and that energy towards finding things that are a good fit for them and things that bring them joy. Like just putting that perspective shift on anything is going to dramatically increase your life. You know, studies show that confidence is more heavily correlated to success than competence, right? Confidence is more heavily correlated to likability, to influence, influence, to credibility, than again, actual knowledge right? Like we want confidence. This is something that will help us moving forward. And again, by having the belief that you can rely upon yourself or something or someone or a deity will allow you to take on any uncertain situation, regardless of what's coming up in the economy, regardless of, of what's coming up uh, in current events, regardless of what's going on with your family or your relationship uh, financially, it doesn't matter because you know that you can handle it. So by being able to disassociate from that negative emotion it allows you to move to more positive emotions while also being able to surround yourself with people that also vibe on that type of level. It's it's a life-changing thing for not only how you perceive your day-to-day, -day, your interactions and your relationships, how you become successful in your career, how you make money. I mean, it, it, it just blows away those limiting beliefs, right? I, to I totally agree. And honestly, and then, I mean, everything, you have said that leads up to this point is completely true. I've had such an amazing conversation. This has been uh, such a great conversation talking with you. It's been incredible. I love it. And, and I'll tell you, if people want to continue that conversation with you, how do they find you? How do they connect with you? Where, what do you got going on in your life right now? Other than the Hillary show, which is awesome. And I'm going to check out here. Yeah. Soon. Yeah, I, I mean, the best place to find me and all my resources is hillarybillings.com. And Josh, I know you have a link to that. Uh, there you can find my free workbook, which is your four steps to quit confidence. This is where when we're trying to build confidence, we do not want to be reliant upon external forces. And oftentimes that's where we pull our confidence is from that validation. So in this four steps to quit confidence, I break down four of the confidence killers that you run into every day and what you can be doing to help build it up and working on yourself. Because when it's in your control, it's in your control. And then the only only person that you have to worry about and rely upon is yourself. So just taking that step to become more self-reliant, you will indeed become more confident. So you can get my free workbook there uh, and check out my additional resources at hillarybillings.com. And that is in the comments. So if you guys want to click that, check that out. That's linked. Hillary, this has been such an incredible conversation with you. Such a pleasure. People don't want you to leave. I'm getting comments. Uh, uh, we'll do more. We'll do more. Absolutely. We will. This has been so great. Honestly, uh, and speaking of, I don't know if you can hear all this background noise. Now they've decided to landscape. There's all kinds of stuff I going on. I thought they were landing planes nearby. <laughs> yeah. <It's fine>. Seriously. <laughs> it's insane. Always but an adventure. Thank, thank you so much for your time today. I, this, I've so enjoyed this conversation. You're an inspiration. If, honestly, guys, reach out to Hillary. She Me is too. definitely somebody to emulate. And I just want to say thanks again. This is fantastic. Oh, so great. Thank you, everyone, for watching and being a part of this. All right. All right, guys. Well, this wraps up another episode of Fire Builders Live. So thankful that you decided to join us. This is Josh and Hillary signing off. Have a great day, and we will see you again soon. See ya.